Okay, I'm going to start this video broadcast, and a friend of mine uh, actually asked me, a friend of mine, Shane, asked me what I thought of a certain passage of Scripture, John uh, 4, verse 34, where Jesus says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. And so he asked me what I thought of that verse, and I... Uh, we were talking about it, and I decided to make a little video broadcast on that matter. And uh, when it talks about doing the work of God and my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, Jesus was speaking metaphorically when his disciples actually shortly before that literally asked him, uh, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not, that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And then Jesus replies, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so Jesus was trying to teach them a, a, an actual lesson. We see Jesus from time to time would take a literal instant incident and convey a spiritual lesson through that. And so basically what Jesus is saying is, you know, I'm going to teach you about spiritual food, spiritual nourishment. You know, you're thinking about physical food. I want to teach you something about spiritual food that satisfies your soul. And so that's what Jesus is talking about here. We see shortly before Jesus is interacting with a woman who was a Samaritan and he said, woman, Jesus replied, believe in, uh, uh, we'll, we'll start from the beginning. Uh, so we say, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never be, never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give them will come up, come in them, a, become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so Jesus sees this woman drawing water from a well. And so he takes that opportunity to share his message of the gospel with her. We see she is shortly before, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? So he's saying, I'll give you living water to drink. And so she replies, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the, the well and drank from it himself, as did also the sons, his sons and his livestock? And so Jesus goes on to say, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so, at this point, the woman's like, the woman said to him, Sir, she probably said it sarcastically too, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go and call your husband to come and come back. And so he tests her in this. He says, go and call your husband. And then she says, I have no husband. She replied, Jesus said to her, you are right in what you say you have no husband. In fact, you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What ha you have said, what you just said is quite true. So Jesus is like telling her about her life that she didn't really tell him any of this stuff, but he just tells her how it is. And Jesus knew what was going on in this woman's life. And so we see, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but the Jews claim that this place, the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And so Jesus then replies, Woman, Jesus uh, woman, Jesus replied, believe in me, there is a time coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, 
for salvation is from the Jews. Yet at a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah, called the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. And so this blows this woman's mind to the point where she goes back and she tells everybody what she has just encountered. She has experienced Jesus Christ uh, personally. Uh, and uh, she says when she's then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have found food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food, my food? said Jesus is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So we see on the first occasion, Jesus is talking to this woman that he explains his gospel to. And at first she's thinking literal water. Now we see the disciples after that incident come and think, well, someone must have brought Jesus food while we were away. And he's like, no, no, I'm not talking about literal food. I'm talking about my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. And so this woman, let's first start with the woman's perspective. She was going from man to man, obviously, probably, probably the case. She was probably going from one man to another to find that the very thing her heart craved, but she couldn't seem to find that in a man. And then Jesus explains, you know, I am who you seek. You know, I am the one who can satisfy your thirst. I am the one who can totally take away the soul thirst that you have. And he says, I am the Messiah. And so we see Jesus express that to her. He even, he even recounts some of the things she did that she knew he didn't know anything about. And so uh, she goes back, she tells the people in her town and they come hear Jesus speak. And many of them believe as a result. And so, you know, and Jesus' disciples were surprised that he was talking to a woman, for one, in that day and time. It was not, uh, it was not common for a highly distinguished Jewish rabbi to associate with a, to be speaking with a woman. You know, unfortunately, in those times, women were considered less than by society. It's not the way it was in God's eyes, but in that culture, women seem to have less of a position of respect and honor. And Jesus actually shows her that she is worth talking to, that her life matters, that. And you know, the, uh, another thing that this surprised the disciples were, was the fact that she was a Samaritan and the Jew, and Jesus was talking with a Samaritan woman of all things, because the Samaritans were not regarded by the Jews as people to associate with. The Samaritans were shared an ancestry with the ancient Assyrians and Jews that had intermarried and from that came the Samaritans. They were regarded as unclean by the Jews. But we see Jesus goes out of his way to talk to this woman, not caring whether she's a Samaritan or a woman, but he comes to share his gospel message with her. And so we see this woman felt this love that was unlike anything she had experienced in her life. And Jesus is saying, basically saying, I am the very source of everything your hungry soul and heart craves for. My love is what you need. And so, and we, we let's go back to the disciples' perspective when he tells them, you know, they say, Master, did somebody bring you some food while we were away? And Jesus said, well, I have food here you don't even know about. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. And so let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about the purpose and fulfillment that comes from doing the will of God and doing his work. There is no greater satisfaction than knowing we are loved by God, we are forgiven by God, 
and he has called us to do things for his glory. Being used by God is one of the most fulfilling things we can ever experience. Being on mission for God is a truly soul satisfying thing. It gives us a sense of purpose. It gives us, when we discover our calling and we start doing what God has created us to do, it satisfies a very deep need inside ourselves. As human beings, we all have a desire to feel accepted. We all have a desire to have purpose. We all want to feel significant. And you know, through that, through doing the work of the Lord, we can experience that satisfaction for our soul hunger. A lot of people are running to all sorts of other things. You know, they grab for alcohol, they grab for sex, they grab for drugs. They grab for one relationship after another, like this woman did, but you know, Jesus was bringing a message, a gospel message, that would satisfy the deep hunger of the soul, and he was using a literal comparison of like thirst from physical, literal thirst, wanting water for our bodies, and literal food. He said, well, you know, he used that as an object lesson to depict spiritual hunger because we're not just physical bodies. We can eat physical food, we can drink physical water, but you know, we are more to it than that. You know, uh, even, even some secular psychology gives credence to the fact that uh, human beings are more than just physical, be physical beings that desire food, water, shelter. You know, we desire acceptance, we desire love, we desire all sorts of emotional needs too. You know, even secular psychology says that. But you know, the answer is in the gospel, is where Jesus Christ fills that deep hunger of the soul. And he gives us what our heart is truly craving, the sense of purpose, the sense of doing something worthwhile and significance. You know, knowing that we are loved by God and that in spite of our sins, he still laid down his life to save us and he wants to call us unto newness of life and give us a second chance of life. That is very satisfying to know that. It's a, it brings a sense of love to think that God, who hates sin, who sees us all as sinful creatures that have broken his law, still wants to accept us back to himself. That is a love unlike anything else. And so, that's the type of love that Jesus Christ demonstrates when he lays down his life for us. And so let's talk about the element of purpose that comes from doing the work of God. You know, there's, there's times in my life where, you know, I, I've experienced this firsthand. You know, I feel very fulfilled doing what I feel like God has called me to do. And when we're doing the work of the Lord, it says like Jesus taught in Matthew 6 33 seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you he's in that passage he was teaching the disciples not to worry not to worry about the future not to worry about what they will eat what they will drink or what they will wear but basically he's saying focus first and foremost on living rightly and seeking my kingdom above all else and God will take care of the rest you have need for and you know he does that not just in the physical sense. We have physical needs, but we also have emotional needs. And so when we're doing the work of the Lord and we're pouring ourselves into doing what pleases him, he gives us a sense of satisfaction and joy that are unlike anything else. He satisfies our hearts in a way nothing else can. We find, we find it so true, like the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it didn't, I don't think what the psalmist was meaning there was you cannot want, but you shall not want. Meaning, when we're doing the work of the Lord, when we're fulfilling our true purpose, the hunger for the things of this world diminish. We feel that sense of purpose. We feel that sense of satisfaction. We feel those, ex those cravings for other things diminish. We find ourselves satisfied. We feel the joy. We feel the peace. We feel the purpose that we have, and the Lord takes away that hunger in us. He satisfies us with himself. As 
Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that does not exactly mean you'll get everything you want or everything you pray for. But it does mean that when we're delighting in the Lord, we get the desires of our heart. If our heart's desire is the Lord, and we truly realize how good he is and how awesome it is to be in his presence, you know, he won't withhold that from us. He will let us be satisfied with his presence. As the psalmist also said, for at your right hand, there is the fullness of joy and eternal pleasures forevermore. And that means we can experience that joy and that closeness and that fellowship, and that spiritual intimacy with the Lord as we seek him first and foremost above everything else. God bless.